All right, turn to Matthew 19. We left off with Jesus talking about forgiveness. He uses the example of the unforgiving servant to make his point. You know, the unforgiving servant, remember he was forgiven by his master, 10,000 talents of silver, and that equals about 375 tons. And we saw that it would take him about 150,000 years to pay off his debt, which is impossible. That was the whole point. But the master freely forgave him. But then he goes to another servant, this wicked servant. He goes to another guy, throws him in jail because he owed him three months of back wages. And he didn't show the same mercy and forgiveness. So Jesus used that as an example of how we need to be willing to forgive those who have wronged us. Ephesians 4.32 sums it up like this. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And so how appropriate that is that the first part of chapter 19 deals with marriage. <laughs> you better know how to forgive. Deals with divorce. You better know how to forgive. After all, unforgiveness is probably one of the main reasons for divorce. And unforgiveness is probably one of the main reasons for bitterness after there is a divorce. So, chapter 19, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Jesus now leaves the Sea of Galilee for the last time. This area on the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, that was his headquarters for about three years. This is where he, this was his home base for much of his ministry. He goes down towards the Dead Sea. He'll be on the Jordanian side of the Jordan River where uh, John the Baptist first announced who Christ was. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's just north of the Dead Sea. And so he's leaving Sea of Galilee region for the last time. He will go back after he rises from the dead, before he ascends up into heaven. But here in verse 1, Jesus and the disciples will travel to that area near the Dead Sea on the Jordanian side. Um, from where he is, it's about 20 miles straight west to Jerusalem. And that's where he's slowly making his way because he has to go there, as we'll see. Verse 2, And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. So Jesus had massive crowds following him wherever he went, and it simply says he healed them there. We've already seen why he was healing them, because he had compassion on the people. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd, and he just loved them, and he just wanted to minister to them. And he didn't turn away anybody who was sincerely in need and who was seeking him out, because again, Jesus saw them in their helpless, hopeless state. They were like uh, sheep wandering aimlessly, and he loved them. And spiritually speaking, the, the religious leaders had nothing to offer the people. You know, Jesus set them free. He gave them hope. He gave them life. What did the religious leaders offer them? Nothing but heavy burdens. That's why Jesus said back in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he'll go on to say, My yoke is easy. My burden is light. In other words, in Christ, we find that joy, that peace, love, eternal life, forgiveness. It's not found in all the rules, rituals, and regulations of religion. Those things just put a heavy burden upon you. So as Jesus is blessing the people, the multitudes, no doubt everybody's having a great time being with Jesus, just hearing what he has to say. But guess who crashes the party? Verse 3, the Pharisees also came to him testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Talk about a bunch of killjoys. I mean, this is a really a random question to ask Jesus while he's ministering, healing, just blessing the people. And they just throw this question at him in the midst of this great multitude of people. And notice that it says here they question him in order to test him. And from this point on, they will ask some random questions of him for the purpose of trying to trip him up, testing him, trying to see if they could catch him in something where they could accuse him. Because again, their ultimate goal, they want to destroy him. So again, they say 
They asked Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? In the law, specifically Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, look at this verse. Moses said, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. So yes, it is lawful for a man to divorce his wife. That's not the issue here. But their question to Jesus is, can he divorce her for just any reason? For whatever reason he comes up with. Divorce has always been one of those hot topic buttons, you know, and people, especially men, have looked for loopholes to try to get out of their marriages. Now, in Jesus' day, there were two main schools of thought. There was a rabbi named Shammai, and there was a rabbi named Hillel. Shammai was considered the conservative rabbi. He taught, using Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, that a man could only divorce his wife if there was sexual immorality, or if he found out after they were married that she was not a virgin. Then he could write her a certificate of divorce. Rabbi Hillel, on the other hand, had a whole list of things. He was the so-called liberal of the day, of reasons why you could ask your wife to leave. Some of the things on his list, and these are part of what he taught, for example, unclean, if the wife burns a meal, he could write her certificate of divorce. If the wife said something negative about his parents that he didn't appreciate, he, you know, he could write her a certificate of divorce. If she snores too loud, you could write a certificate of divorce. By the way, guess who had the biggest following of these two rabbis? Rabbi Hillel, because so many of these men, like our society, were very fleshly. Many of these religious leaders, even in Jesus' day, had 10, 15, 20 marriages and divorces. They looked at women as cattle, so to speak. They just, yeah, I'll try this one out for a while. Nah, she doesn't please me. Write her certificate of divorce. Send her away. Watch how Jesus answers their question by taking them back to the original design and plan for marriage. Verse 4. He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? I love this. First of all, he says, Have you not read? You know, that's a big problem when it comes to people who don't believe God's word. It's a big problem to those who come against and question God's word. Or they just haven't read it. Or they don't want to believe what God's Word is actually saying about something. And they don't believe this is powerful. It's living. It's God's eternal Word. So Jesus takes him back to the very first chapter of the first book, the book of Genesis. So again, he says, at the beginning, God made them. He literally created them, male and female. So at the beginning, in other words, it didn't take millions of years of evolution to get Adam and Eve to come on the scene walking upright. That's nonsense. That, you cannot prove evolution. That's why it's called the theory of evolution. I would rather believe in the facts of God's Word. And Jesus quotes from Genesis 1. Jesus believes Genesis 1. So you either believe God created Adam and Eve or you think Jesus is a liar. That's what it boils down to. So at the beginning... It was at the beginning of creation, specifically day six, God made Adam and Eve. Genesis 1.27, this is what Jesus quotes. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Again, God only created two genders, male and female. I don't know what the number is up to today. I don't know, last I saw it was like 91 or two genders they've come up with. Are you kidding me? There's only two. God made male and female. By the way, for those of you who were here when we went through the, the book of Genesis, the wording in Hebrew is very clear that God created the entire universe, including earth and all the things on the earth in six 
literal days, six 24-hour days. Now, remember, the Hebrew word day is yom, Y-O-M. 99% of the time, it's used as a 24-hour day. The only time it's not used as a 24-hour day is when it says in the plural, in the days of the judges, something like that. So it's referring to a time frame where the judges were ruling, and it goes on to say, and everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. Also remember at the end of each day of creation, it says, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day, the third day, and on to the sixth day, Genesis 1.31. When God it was finished, we read, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. These are not millions and millions of years for each day. You, put, you look at them in order and it would be impossible to have life on earth if the sun didn't shine for millions and millions of years. You can't have plants and everything else before the sun, so unless it's in a 24-hour day. The point is these Pharisees are telling Jesus, hey, let's go back to Moses. What does Jesus do? He says, no, let's go further back to the Garden of Eden. Let's go back to when God created Adam and Eve in the Garden. So he continues, verse 5, and, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So here Jesus brings up the very first marriage, the ideal marriage. Again, let's look at what God did at the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. This is where we see how God made Adam. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being now, when it says the Lord God formed man, the word formed is yatsar, Y-A-T-S-A-R. Yatsar means to form something out of clay. It's a potter molding something, shaping something out of a lump of clay. That's exactly what God did. It says he takes a handful of dirt, he fashions it into this complete, mature, amazing creation that he calls Adam, man. He doesn't become a living being until God breathes the breath of life into him. Also notice in this verse that Adam did not come to life until he breathes into his nostrils. It's like, you know, God giving him CPR on which is breathe that breath of life and he comes alive. Amazing. When Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit is what died. They lived for many years afterwards, but in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And they died spiritually that day. This is also why God told Adam after he sinned against God, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. You've heard me say it before, the same 17 elements that make up common dirt or soil are the same 17 elements that make up a human body. You dissolve us down, that's what you end up with, the same 17 elements. So that should keep you humble. Oh, I'm just so wonderful, I'm so great. Now you're a dirt clod. <laughs> but I'm anointed by the Holy Spirit, so you're a mud ball. Well, we'll say women are a little more feminine and they're more beautiful. So we'll call them dust bunnies. How's that? <laughs> Either way, after God created Adam, he said, It is not good the man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Genesis 2.21, this is where we're told how God did this. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. So he wasn't hunting the bushes looking for a wife. It was when he was knocked out. He was asleep. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now you wonder why at weddings you see the father of the bride taking the bride down the aisle and then handing him her off to the groom-to-be. Well, that's where it comes from. God takes Eve and brings, it says he brings her, brought her to the man. 
Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then here's the part Jesus quotes from in Matthew 19, 5. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so the two becoming one flesh. That's a, a marvelous mystery it's a sacred act that only God can make happen, and it can only happen in God's design for marriage. Think of it like this. From one person, Adam, God made two people, Adam and Eve. And for the two people to become one, there has to be a reunion of what God took out of man. And that was the woman, Eve. And that's the only reason God does not recognize a civil union or a marriage of people of the same sex. A man was not taken out from another man. A woman was not taken out from another woman. It was a woman taken out from a man. God brings them back together, and that is a biblical marriage. Adam acknowledges here in Genesis 2.23, she was taken out of man, and the two shall become one flesh. And so in God's design for marriage, a man and a woman would become one flesh. Or as Jesus says here in verse 6, they would be joined together by the Lord. Joined together means to be stuck together. And think of it as like the greatest super glue in the universe. That's because God ordains marriage. In a God-ordained marriage, in that marriage we are not two separate people. We are joined together as one, physically and spiritually in Christ. That's a bond that God does not want us to break. Uh, by the way, Elizabeth and I just celebrated our 42nd anniversary on Friday. Yay! Yay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're applauding for her that she stuck it out that long with me, I know. That's true. But anyway, so 42 years. Anybody married longer than 42 years in here? 50 years. 50 years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back there. 55 years. 60 years. 60? Anybody? Yeah, George and Susie. Awesome. Woo! And that was just last summer, right? 60 years? Praise the Lord. That's amazing. Wow. You've been married a long time. Time flies when you're having fun, though, huh? Yeah. I think 42 years, I feel like a stupid idiot still. I mean, I haven't figured it out, but God is gracious. He's good. But, by the way, the institution of marriage is the only thing that we have today that was pre-fall of mankind. Think of that. The only thing from paradise that still remains is marriage. That's it. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Notice it's not who God joined together, but it's what God has joined together. The what is His design, His plan, His creation of marriage. Again, this is why a biblical marriage is the only marriage that God honors, blesses, endorses, and acknowledges. Verse 7, They, these Pharisees, said to Him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And he, Jesus, said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Very interesting here. Remember when Jesus told these religious leaders, have you not read? Well, this is a great example that they did not understand what God's Word said. Or if they did understand it, they chose to reinterpret it in its clear teaching because Moses did not command to give her a certificate of divorce. You know, he says, no, because of the hardness of your hearts, he permitted you to. First of all, the commandment was you had to give her a certificate of divorce because that was the only way that she could get remarried. That's the only way that she would not become destitute in that culture. If they were put away without that certificate of divorce, they were looked down upon by society. They were destined to a life of poverty and shame because nobody else would ever want them. 
But here Jesus clarifies to these men, Moses permitted you to divorce because of the hardness of your heart. The word hardness there in the Greek is scleros. You know what we get from that, right? Arterior sclerosis, a hardening of the arteries in the heart. I'd probably be pretty accurate to say 99% of the time divorces are the result of the husband or the wife or both having hardened hearts. And for marriages that are successful in God's eyes, it takes both the husband and the wife to recognize my heart is becoming hard here, and I need to take this to the Lord, and I need the Holy Spirit to soften my heart because nobody's perfect. We're all going to stumble and bumble around in our marriages. There's, there's no perfect marriage. There's only a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ, and so we need to let the Holy Spirit continually soften up our hearts. So again, it was because of the hardness of their hearts that Moses permitted them to divorce. He commanded them to at least give them a certificate of divorce and to stop treating their wives so treacherously. Why do I say that? Because here we have an example from Malachi chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. Again, the last Old Testament book written about 400 years before Jesus shows up. It says, Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. So one of the purposes of a godly marriage is to have godly children, raise them up in the ways of the Lord. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Treacherously would be send her out because she burned breakfast. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. And so I would have to say that God takes marriage very seriously. But here's the key to every successful marriage. We must acknowledge, we must recognize that the head of every marriage needs to be Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can keep our marriages together. In fact, Jesus is the only one that brings something perfect into the marriage. He's the only one that can make a perfect contribution to the marriage. Because I'm far from perfect. All I have to do is Hang out with Elizabeth for a while, and you can quiz her. That's fine. She knows I'm not perfect. I know she's less perfect. <laughs> or no. How do I want to say that? <laughs> or maybe I should just shut up now. <laughs> she's a lot closer to perfect than I am. Let's put it that way. Um, anyway, he's the only one who can knit our hearts together with his heart. You know, can two sinners make a godly marriage? No. Two sinners can't do it on their own. You need the Lord in the midst of it. Don't forget Ecclesiastes 4, verse 12. This is why this is part of a lot of marriage ceremonies. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So Jesus is the real superglue in any marriage that keeps us together, keeps our marriages strong. Now, here's something else to consider. Even though God hates divorce, God does not hate divorced people. You need to understand that. God sent Jesus to heal broken hearts. Just look over Luke 4.18. He sent Jesus to heal broken hearts, set at liberty those who are captive, set at liberty those who are oppressed. Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But the fact of the matter is, God himself actually wrote a certificate of divorce to what the Bible calls his wife, the nation of Israel. So not all divorce is wrong. This is what it says. And why was the divorce? Because Israel committed spiritual adultery. It's Jeremiah 3, verse 8. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away 
and given her a certificate of divorce. This is God speaking. Yet her treacherous sister, Judah, did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So as much as God hates divorce, he divorced them. But you know what? They got reconciled. And they will be reconciled in the near future when Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom on the earth. So look at verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Again, Jesus is speaking against the flippant ways that these people were treating marriage and divorce. He's speaking of the sacredness, the seriousness of marriage. Again, divorce is not the unpardonable sin. And where sin abounds, grace abounds much more, we're told in Romans. But when you study out the scriptures, there's only three biblical scenarios for getting remarried. Number one is if your spouse dies. I don't get any ideas. Doesn't mean you can slip them something and knock them off. That's not enough. If they just die of natural causes, then you're free to remarry. So that's the first one. The second one is abandonment. If the unbelieving spouse abandons the wife, abandons the husband, if it's the unbelieving wife, if they abandon the spouse and they go off, then you're free to remarry. This is what Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 15. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. And then the third one is adultery, sexual immorality, and that is what Jesus is referring to here. And so those are the things that break the cords that God has bound us together with. But as always, number one thing to consider, if you've separated, is to pray. See if the Lord would reconcile. Healing, reconciliation, forgiveness, that's always the ideal. It doesn't always happen, as you know, but God can do it. Satan is doing all he can to steal, kill, and destroy marriages, but God can heal, restore. And even if you've been divorced and remarried, God can certainly do a new work in your life. And he has in many of you. So verse 10, his disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. In other words, come on, Jesus, you're being stricter than Moses. Then why bother to get married at all? Like I said earlier, these disciples are still very much in process. They haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit yet. They haven't been sealed by the Spirit into the body of Christ. So everything Jesus has been telling them leaves them thinking, we can't do ministry the way he tells us to do ministry. We can't live out our lives the way he tells us to live out our lives. And they're absolutely right. But that's also why Jesus will tell them in the next few months, as they get to Jerusalem, remember that week when he gets into Jerusalem, he'll tell them, you can read through, you know, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, where he is telling them, you know, apart from me, you can do nothing. But I will send the helper, the Holy Spirit, and he, when he comes, he will teach you all things. He'll bring to remembrance all things that I've told you. You can't do it, but he will do it in you and through you. So in addition to the filling of the Holy Spirit coming upon their lives, which would take place in the day of Pentecost, he promises them, Again, in Acts or in John 16, that I will come into you and my Father will come into you. You got the triunity of God, the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit dwelling in us. How can we not have success in life, in marriage, in all kinds of things with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwelling in us, with the Word of God effectively working upon us? I mean, God wants us to have victory in every area of our lives. That includes having a beautiful marriage, raising godly children, being there for our grandchildren, and being the kind of Christian that simply radiates the love and joy and peace and grace and righteousness and compassion of Jesus Christ wherever we go, with whomever we're with. But at this point in their lives, these disciples are thinking that being married to one person for life, that was too hard But again, in that culture, at that time, it was common for them to have one or two or three wives or to have a bunch of wives and divorce them 
or to have concubines, or to visit prostitutes. They said anything goes. This is why Jesus is saying, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis. This is the way God designed marriage. So, verse 11, But he said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. So what saying is he referring to? Well, that the husband and the wife can become one. One flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. All cannot accept that saying. And so notice what he talks about. If you can't accept that saying, maybe you've called, been called to be single. That's his point here in verse 12. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. Ow. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. And so in speaking of a single life and remaining celibate, Jesus answers their question, their statement, it's better not to marry by letting them know, hey, marriage, married life can be great, but the single life can be great as well. But here, Jesus mentions three types of eunuchs. Notice the first one, he says, those who were born eunuchs. In other words, they remain single their whole life because they have no desire to get married. That's just, they don't care about marriage. They don't care about the sexual relationship. They just, it's not an interest to them. That's fine. God didn't call me to be a eunuch. Praise the Lord. Then he mentions the others who were made eunuchs. That's why I said, ow, because the common practice, if one nation conquered another nation, they would take the leading young men of that nation they conquered, they would bring them into the king's court, and usually these kings would have a lot of concubines and wives and everything else, but they wanted those guys that they captured not to mess around, so they castrated them. That's heavy duty. So that's what the second one is. Then the third eunuch that Jesus mentions are those men who chose to remain single in order to dedicate their lives to serving the Lord 100%. That's what it means when he says, um, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. This third group is what Paul refers to when he mentions these this situation, 1 Corinthians 7, look at these verses, starting in verse 7. For I wish that all men were even as I myself. At this time, Paul was single. It's always assumed that he was married beforehand because he was also a rabbi, and one of the qualifications of being a rabbi was to be married. So he was probably married at some point. We don't know what happened. His wife may have died. She may have left him. We don't know. So, he says, but each one has his own gift from God. Marriage is a gift. Singleness is a gift if it's from God. One in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, yeah, that's me, let them marry for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. That's why I say most guys, you know, I go with, back with what God said in the beginning. It's not good for a man to be alone. So I said, okay. That's all I needed to hear. So the bottom line is this. Be the man, be the woman that God wants you to be. If you're single, serve the Lord with your whole heart. If you're both Christians married together in the Lord, you're one. So serve the Lord with your whole heart. There's no difference. We should do all things for God's glory. That's true if you're married to an unbeliever. Jesus must be first and foremost in your life. This all goes back to the fact that without Jesus, we can do nothing, right? With Christ, we can do all things through Him who strengthens us. So verse 13, we'll wrap it up here with these verses. Then little children were brought to Him that He might put His hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. 
Now, I like to bring in some of the other Gospels when we see similar scenario or the same scenario, just in the other Gospels, because in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, we see some more details about this situation here. This is what we read. Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Can you imagine? These moms, dads bringing their little kids to Jesus. You can't do that. Get back. No, he doesn't want to touch these kids. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, take note of that phrase, greatly displeased. It means he had righteous indignation towards his disciples. He would have righteous indignation at times toward the religious leaders. You know, he flips over their money changers, tables, and so forth. This is the only time Jesus has righteous indignation towards his disciples. He was not pleased. He was greatly displeased with them because they're trying to keep little children away from him. So he says there in Mark 10, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms. Can you just picture Jesus taking these little kids in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them? I mean, this ties in with what we saw back in chapter 18 of Matthew's gospel, where Jesus said, unless you're converted and become like little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he says... Anyone who caused one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it'd be better for them to have a millstone hung around their neck, tossed into the Sea of Galilee, drowned in the depth of the sea. So make no mistake about it, Jesus loves the little children. And why wouldn't he? He's the creator of life. Life begins at conception. He's the sustainer of life. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And Jesus definitely wants all children to know that he loves them and he wants to bless them. And so in this section of Matthew 19, we go from marriage to divorce to singleness to children. And for those of you who have little children, how great it is to know that Jesus wants you to bring your little child, your children, to him. He wants you to know that he will come against anyone that comes against your child. He also wants you to know that the best thing any of us could do for our children and now for our grandchildren is to bring them to Jesus. Nothing greater, nothing better. Now we've seen this scenario over and over again in Matthew's Gospel where desperate moms, desperate dads would bring their like demon-possessed son, their daughter that was demon-possessed, other children that had different diseases and ailments. They would bring these children to Jesus, and He touched them, He healed them, He set them free. This is why, you know, when parents ask me, well, how old should my child be before they get baptized or before they take communion? My answer is always, ask the child. Do they want to take communion? Do they know what it means? Do they love Jesus? That's all it takes. Why would I want to turn them away? You know, do they want to get baptized? If it's just, I want to get wet like everybody else, then they're not quite ready. But if they're like, no, I love Jesus. I want to identify my life with Jesus. Then I don't know how old. You'll know your own children. It's not too hard for children to believe in Jesus. In fact, I think most people have to talk children out of believing in the Lord. That's what we see in our public schools. How many kids get turned away from Christ because they talk about everything but the Lord? They believe evolution. It's a theory of evolution. I'd rather believe in the fact of God's Word. Be that as it may, can you imagine Jesus taking your child, your grandchild into His arms and just holding them, touching them, blessing them? How amazing is that? I think that's the real meaning behind Proverbs 22, verse 6. Where it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And when Jesus laid his hands on children, it was to bless them. Now, as parents, yes, we know there needs to be discipline. That's part of it. But we also need to put our hands upon our children to bless them, to reach out to them, to hug them, 
Jonah likes to give me a high five. You know, I mean, it's awesome when your children love that. You know, Acacia, I got to tell her, stop squeezing me so hard. I mean, every time she sees me, like, and it's like, you're going to make me pop. But, you know, I love it. And they need that loving touch. They need that helping hand. Little ones need to see more of Jesus from us and less of us from us. You know what I mean? So we'll close there. We'll pick up, Lord willing, next week in verse 16 with the guy that comes along saying, Good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And it's a great scene as we'll look at that and we'll go into chapter 20, Lord willing.